Jacket. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Jewels on the Wing, Butterflies of Summer with Larry Mead. My name is Ashley Studholm. I'm the Programs Director for the Prince William Conservation Alliance. We're your local environmental nonprofit working to create sustainable and equitable communities throughout Prince William County. And we do that through a variety of ways, hosting programs like this to connect people to nature. Uh, we advocate for smart growth and environmental friendly policies, and we foster uh, stewardship practices that, um, that help protect the natural resources that we have. And you can stay up to date with all the things that we're involved in by going to our website at pwconserve.org. And from there, you can um, gain access to our YouTube channel or to our blog. And we just have a wealth of information available on the variety of topics that we are covering and following. And while you're there, you can click on calendar to check out our upcoming events. And we have a lot of things that we're planning currently, uh, but one thing you'll notice is right here, the butterfly survey, which is next Sunday, um, July, is it July 16th or 17th? Well, in any, in any case. Uh, 16 is correct. Okay. I had it in my head the 17th, so thanks, Larry. So next Sunday, we're hosting the Butterfly Count, and this program is kind of a primer to that count. And if anyone here is interested in participating in our Manassas Circle, please let me know. Reach out to me at alliance at pwconserve.org. You are welcome to join us. There's no um, previous experience necessary. You'll be paired up with an expert um, and as long as you just come and willing to hang out with cool people like us uh, and counting butterflies you're more than welcome to join and i just wanted to note that we offer these programs free of charge and we are able to do that even though they're not free to host and to um, organize through the kindness and generosity of our community and that uh, people like you. And so if you like what we do and you um, you you like that we're, we're having these programs accessible to everyone and you wanna support us, then while you're here, you can go ahead and click join us and that'll take you to a secure page where you can um, donate and whether that is $5 or $100, I can testify that it truly makes a difference and you make our work possible. So thank you for that. Now, we're going to jump into the program here. Um, and I just wanted to say that while we're going through and learning about the diversity of butterflies that we have here in Prince William County, if you have a question or um, or a comment about one of the butterflies that we're discussing, go ahead and use the, the feature to raise your hand or put something in the chat and I'll open it up and we'll have a little bit more of a free flowing dialogue tonight. And so with that, we're here with Larry Mead. Larry is the president of the Northern Virginia Bird Club. He's on the adult education committee uh, with the Autobahn. He's the compiler for the butterfly count in Alexandria. And for those that were here in the beginning, has been participating in a wide variety of butterfly counts throughout the region. He is a writer, a photographer. Uh, he leads talks and just has a wealth of knowledge. I know I always learn a ton anytime we have him on. And I'm just so grateful that he's in the house again with us tonight. So Larry, thank you and take it away. All right. Um, so let me just say a little bit about the program. Uh, we're basically just going to, we'll talk about kind of butterflies in general, and then uh, I'll uh, go over some of the different species that we might see. Can't do them all, of course, but uh, most of the ones we'll see, and focusing on the ones that are kind of get be confusing. So uh, let me know. So let me get it going here. Okay. Sure. All right. There we go. Can you see that? We sure can. 
Awesome. All right. So, uh, all, oh, by the way, all these photos are mine. And uh, this, well, starting out, this is a female Eastern Tiger Swallowtail. It is the uh, state insect of Virginia. And one of my favorite butterflies. You can see why it's called a tiger swallowtail. And I'll talk more about how to tell the difference between the swallowtails as we go. So, let's see. Are we not? Oh, hang on. There we go. So, butterfly anatomy. You can see, uh, sometimes we'll, talk, we'll use some of this jargon when we're talking about butterfly identification. Uh, the different cells we'll talk about are, are the inside areas. And of course, you have the head and the abdomen, like any insect. They do have six legs. So we'll talk about the, the outer margin that can be important, the inner margin. So it's just kind of a basic anatomy of the butterflies. Okay. Uh, one thing people ask a lot is, what's the difference between a butterfly and a moth? Well, here, here's something I found that gives you the difference. Um, for uh, Actually, the one thing to remember, though, is butterflies actually are moths. They're all Lepidoptera, so butterflies are basically day-flying moths. But they're a different family, and there are differences between what we call colloquially moths and butterflies. Um, most butterflies, well, pretty much butterflies only fly in the daytime. Moths will fly at night. A lot of you have some day flying moths, and you will find them. Um, one thing that really can tell you that something's a butterfly is they have that knob on the end of the antenna. You'll see that on all our butterflies, all our skippers, and none of the moths. The moths do not have that knob on the end of the antenna. Um, moths are also, they tend to hold their wings differently. Um, their antenna tend to be more uh, thicker, you know, like little feathers. And uh, they have the fuzzy body. And like I said, the wings are held straight on butterflies. On moths, not so much. Although skippers can be different. All right. So one thing to remember is uh, the plants. Plants are very important for butterflies. Host plants are where the caterpillars eat. You can see this is a, uh, I took this in Loudoun County several years ago. This is a monarch butterfly caterpillar. And he's on what he eats, milkweed. And that's all they eat is milkweed. So that's what a host plant is. It's what the caterpillars eat. This one is big. Hey, Larry. This, yes, go we ahead. We have a quick question. Sure, um, sure. Someone was asking if we know what the knob on the antenna is when you were distinguishing between a moth and a butterfly. Oh, what its function is? Mm -hmm. I think it's a. I think it's a sensory gland. They'll uh, they can sense like the pheromones and, and and different things from the other butterflies. I think that's what it is. Not one hundred percent. Judy's oh. here. Judy, Judy might know, <laughs> but it's Larry. related. Great to question, home. Kevin. Yeah, I'll we'll have to look into that. I think it does have to do with uh, a sense sensory uh, function, though. Yes. Um, anyway. So uh, th this, this is, you know, the classic host plant, milkweed for uh, monarchs. Plant milkweed to help save the monarchs, right? Um, now this guy, one, uh, here's some more, a little bit of butterfly jargon. Uh, caterpillars go what's called, th through what's called instars. So they go through, I think usually about four instars, depending. Um, and the hotter it is, the more, uh, the bigger the instars are. So this guy is big. He's when he gets done with all his end stars, he'll make his chrysalis and or it, it'll make its chrysalis and become a butterfly. This one looks pretty far around. This is a nice, healthy looking caterpillar. So we talk about host plants. And also, by the way, uh, a lot of the butterflies are named for their host plant, like hackberry emperor, because they host on hackberry trees. We'll see those later. Okay, now Someone's next. Someone's asking what an N star is. Uh, just as I mentioned, it's the it's the stages a caterpillar goes through. So if uh, when when they when they get too big for their skin, they will shed their skin and then they're in a new N star. So they'll keep they'll keep shedding their skin until they're ready to uh, get in, make a chrysalis, and become a butterfly. 
So uh, the, the warmer the weather, the, the more, uh, the better they do because insects are solar powered and they like warmth. So uh, anyway, so we also talk about nectar plants, which is for the adults. The adults will eat, uh, this is uh, monarchs again, but these are ones that are migrating in the fall. And this is coastal goldenrod. If you're uh, on, on the shore, and you find coastal golden around in the fall, it's usually going to be covered with monarchs. So they love it, love it, love it. So that's uh, the two functions of flower or plants for them are host and nectaring. Okay, now this is an interesting photo I took. Can anyone, I'll, I'll, I'll put this out to the group. Can anyone tell me what is going on here? <laughs> I think Carrie knows. If anyone knows, you can unmute yourself. And, yeah, just let uh, me know. What, what do you think is going on here? It's hard out there for a butterfly. <laughs> He's not having a good day. Jumping spider. No, that is close. That is a crab spider. Or crab, yeah. Yeah, it is a crab spider. If you can see right there, here's the spider. There's its head. There's the uh, feet legs on the crab spider and what these crab spiders will do is they will get on a flower and it takes several days but they will assume the exact same color as the flower in order to ambush a butterfly that comes in and you can see this 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 guy is this exactly the same color as this flower and that poor <laughs> that poor common buckeye came in and uh got the surprise of his life the last surprise of his life so uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's not not yeah, it's nature. It's not always easy. Good day for the spider though. <laughs> so first one I'll talk about is the eastern tiger swallowtail. As I mentioned, this is the state insect of Virginia. Um, now uh, one thing interesting about these is they have different. The, the females can, can have a black morph. The one on the left is a male. All male eastern tiger swallowtails are yellow. Some females are black, some are yellow. The first slide I showed you was a female uh, eastern tiger swallowtail. It had a lot, instead of, in this area, it had a lot of blue. And you can see on the, this actually is the same species as this one. And you can see sort of uh, vestigial stripes here on the wings. It's kind of translucent. It's in the right light. So uh, this is actually, this is an evolutionary adaptation that they have because uh, what they're doing is they're mimicking pipe vines, which are um, very distasteful, perhaps even poisonous to uh, birds. So, uh, but like I said, some females are yellow, some females are black, all males are yellow. And this one's said the yellow ones are easy to tell, but the black ones can be tricky. Another one of the field marks here is they do not have spots on the body. So if you see a black swallowtail, it's got these sort of see-through wings and it does not have stripes on the body or spots on the body, that's going to be an eastern tiger. Okay. So here's another one. I like that photo. Um, doing what they do. All right. Now here's here's another uh, very common uh, butterfly. This is the spice bush swallowtail, and uh, named for the spice bush, which is their host plant. Um, this one on my left kind of got photobombed by a hummingbird moth. So, like I said, some moths are uh, day flying. Um, now you notice this one does have the spots on the body, unlike the tiger swallowtail. And one good way to tell these is if you look at the orange spot band right here, the inner one, it's interrupted by a blue rocket. I call that a blue rocket. So this rocket is kind of firing through the spot band. And that's a very, uh, that indicates a, that's definitive for spicebush swallowtail. And these guys are pretty big. They're, they're about gonna be about the size of a, of a tiger. So uh, that, that's one of the prettier ones. Um, here's another one you might see, black swallowtail. The males are easy. They have two rows of yellow spots. You can see these when they're flying. They got all this yellow on them. 
Um, and uh, these, these also, they do have the spots on the body. These guys are a little bit smaller, I find, than the others, but not a lot, but slightly. Um, the females are a little trickier, but if you um, you might need a field guide to really tell. But you can see this orange here; that's pretty uh, distinctive. And uh, the spot that has the spots too, but they're much less uh, uh, apparent than on the male, obviously. So that that's that's one of the trickier ones, but a little practice you can get that. But it's good to get photos if you're not sure, and then figure it out later, right? That's true of any of these, anything in nature, actually. So, all right. Here's the one I mentioned, the pipe fine swallowtail, which is distasteful to uh, birds. Um, again, they do have the spots. They, they're, uh, the males are, have this, this just really beautiful blue. This one's a little beat up. And uh, uh, monarch, uh, butterflies only live maybe a month, month and a half. So, except for the monarchs, which we'll talk about. So, uh, but, so he's a little beat up. Maybe a bird took a bite out of his wing, but he's fine. So he's got all this really beautiful blue up here. It's just, just glowing. And then if you look at the bottom, just beautiful. It's got all this huge orange spot band, pretty definitive. Um, I found a lot. I do the Manassas battlefield route, and I find uh, quite a few of these out there during the count. So that's pretty definitive. And then here's another pipe point photo I like. I took this one. Um, oh, it's Stonebridge at the Manassas Battlefield. So you can really see the blue here, as we saw in the other picture. So I thought that one was pretty good. And then, uh, all right. So here's one. This is maybe the easiest butterfly today. Zebra swallowtail, right? <laughs> Big swallowtail. Zebra stripes, right? Pretty easy. Um, these host on pawpaws. So if you're in an area that has pawpaws, you're a good chance of seeing them around. Uh, we Actually, this is something we had a lot of uh, last, uh, on July 3rd at Aquan Bay. I had a lot of zebra swallowtails, maybe a dozen, I think. So uh, they're around. Um, one thing is uh, there's different broods of butterflies during the year, during the, during the season. And uh, this is a late season. It's got the really long tails. If you find an early spring uh, zebra swallowtail, the tails are not as long. So this is a nice specimen here. I think this was, I think I took this photo in August sometime. So uh, that one is a late, late, later season brood. Is uh, I think because of the warm weather, they had more time to grow and get bigger. So all right, let's talk about. These are two that people sometimes confuse. The one on the left is the monarch, and then we have the, the mimic of the monarch, the viceroy, or is it vice versa? But anyway, but uh, the main way to tell the difference, if you see this, uh, this, this band here, it's got a different band here parallel to the terminal band. This is the terminal band, and this is parallel. And also, this butterfly is a little bit smaller than a monarch. It's also less fluttery, I found. They kind of fly more directly. These uh, monarchs uh, flutter. They're flutter bugs, right? They'll flutter a lot. But uh, these well, these are pretty common around here, too. But look, look, you can see this on both top and bottom, this extra band here. And that, that'll, that'll tell you that it's a viceroy. And those, those are two that people get confused sometimes. Um, so here, here's monarchs. Talk about them a little bit, maybe the most charismatic one. Um, so the one on the left is a male, and the one that way to tell the male is these scent glands here, these little spots here on the wing. And also uh, the female is on the right. The female actually has more uh, cells here too, you can see. But this is the way you can really tell is these scent glands here, pheromone glands that the female does not have. This is one I took in uh, September last year. So this could be one of the migratory monarchs. Now let's talk about that. As we know, monarchs do migrate. And, uh, but there are different populations. There's a population in California, which just kind of migrates up and down the California area and around the West. 
and then winters in California. There's also a Florida population, which doesn't really go anywhere. They're just kind of always there. But the ones we have are the Eastern migratory population and they uh, winter in Mexico, as we know. And uh, it's, it's just amazing that these monarchs who's basically great, great grandparents were in Mexico, somehow they're able to find their way back to the same place where, uh, where all the other monarchs are spending the winter. We don't know how they do it. And they are, they are in decline. Uh, they were really bad about 10 years ago, but they've bounced back somewhat from there. Now it's, uh, it's now that basically they, they kind of measure the population by the wintering population, they do aerial surveys and kind of estimate how many uh, monarchs are in each acre down there. But uh, there's been some studies and uh, scientific uh, articles saying that that's not necessarily the best way to measure them because uh, if you look at butterfly counts and surveys and things, uh, in the summer range, they're doing okay. I mean, personally, I saw over a hundred individuals last year, um, you know, throughout the summer. So uh, I don't think they're really going extinct anytime soon. One thing is that insects are able to bounce back very quickly. But I think what happens is when they migrate back to Mexico, they'll go through the drought. You see, they go right through Texas. You can see that, that orange arrow, which has just had terrible droughts. Uh, different years. That that was one year when they really took a beating was there's just a long-term drought and, and they just can't make it through if they have no water. But uh, hopefully they're bouncing back and uh, there's plenty of milkweed around. And uh, I think, I think, yeah, I don't think it's quite as dire as some people make it out to be, but definitely something to keep an eye on. So here's something I found in Cape May in the fall. Um, people will tag these butterflies, and this is one. This is a migratory one, so that's why they're tagging it because this guy's headed to Mexico. Hopefully, some of them actually go to Florida and kind of just stop there, but most of them will turn right and keep going to Mexico. But this one, uh, so what they do is uh, they'll they'll actually hire people down at the monarch grounds to try to recover these tags because not all the monarchs survive, of course. And again, the little kids will be going through all the woods and all the, through the jungle floor looking for these tags. And it's really, it's really helpful. It's just like with uh, birds, they do bands. They put bands on their legs. These are stickers they put on their wings. It doesn't bother the butterflies at all. They're fine. So, all right, let's go over some more uh, butterflies. This is a really pretty one, the Painted Lady. Some of you might be familiar with this. I think a lot of elementary schools have uh, raised them at times. And uh, this one, uh, this one, we are starting to see them now. Gary, you've seen some Painted Ladies this year? I think. No, they've, all been, they've all been uh, American. Okay, I think someone, I think we had one or two on the count. But uh, this is more of a fall species. What they do is they'll, it's called eruption, I-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N, eruption. They'll erupt from the south and kind of migrate up here, uh, lay eggs, and, 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 and then they'll uh, head back south. I'm not even sure if they actually even breed up here. They just kind of show up <laughs> to nectar. So uh, that's kind of, the, the whole thing about that migration is still not that well known, I don't think. But uh, you see a lot more of them in the fall than you do other times of the year. So that's the painted lady. Um, here's the here's the painted lady and American lady. So if you see a lady, these are ladies. The way to tell them apart, the best way is when their wings are closed. You can see these. You can see it when they're open too. Actually, these spots here. See the painted lady has four spots, and then the American lady has two big spots. And uh, that's a really easy way to tell them apart. They're about the same size. But I think uh, this time of year, you're probably going to see more American ladies. But you could see a painted lady. You never know. So that, that's, 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 a, that's a good way to tell them apart. All right, here's have another a question. Sure, go ahead. That's, hold on. 
I lost it. Oh no. <laughs> um. Oh, someone asked, "How does one tag a butterfly?" Going back to the monarch. Oh, uh, they catch them. <laughs> uh, I guess they they just they just I guess they probably just catch them. In, I don't know if they use mist net. They probably just catch them in a net and uh, and uh, hold them by the wings and put the sticker on. Doesn't take that long. And this is also related to the monarch. I just missed a few. So it, um, sure. it, it's. So is it better for elementary teachers to release them in the fall in VA before October? Um, well, one, th one thing about the Raising the Painted Ladies is it's actually not, some, some scientists say it's not a great idea because you're getting ones that are not from the area so the genetics might not match up with this area and it might they might be confused but since they're not really going to migrate like the monarchs do it really is a no-no to get mail order monarchs because they're going to be confused and not know where to go but uh i would say uh it probably doesn't really matter because uh they may they might head back where they want to go i'm not sure where they're going to want to go but I, I would I, I think earlier in the fall because there's yeah probably early fall would be better than spring I mean as opposed to spring I guess Allison do you want to unmute yourself and yeah, clarify I'm not, I'm not the expert on that yes exactly the question is spring versus fall yeah, yeah I would say fall would be better because there's a lot more of them around seems like they're nor naturally here um we do see a few in the spring but it's unusual so thank you thank you sure now you might want to look into that more i'm not 100 percent certain about that <laughs> i'll tell you what i'm not sure all right anything else we good okay so here's the next one this is one of my favorites the red admiral um this is a good example here um the top versus the bottom you can see when he's got a when he's spread out like that he wants to display he wants everyone to see him but then when he's uh got his wings folded he gets really camouflage he's trying to hide right so uh that's a good so this again this is a very obvious uh, butterfly it's got the red and the but when you see it folded up it could be a little tougher to tell might need a field guide for that all right all right the fritillaries this is the great spangled fritillary there this is going to be your most common fritillary this time of year i would say uh, in the fall, you might get more great, uh, variegated, but right now, which I'll get to. But this one is a big orange butterfly. It's got these big uh, spots here on the side. Very pretty. That's on a button uh, bush flower here. And uh, you'll see these around, off and out in fields and uh, around. So keep an eye out for those. Here's our variegated fritillary. This one is different. It's got a different pattern. If you saw the, if you see the pattern here. So again, uh, good to look on a field guide or some kind of online source. Just look at the different patterns on the fritillaries. It's diff they're different. Um, this one is going to be about the size of a great spangle, maybe slightly smaller. But one thing this one has, it's got this pale band right here. These cells here, the kind of median medial cells, are very pale. And it forms kind of a, a, a pattern. So you got dark, light, then kind of darker again here, which you don't see on the Great Spangled. So these are variegated fritillary. All right. Ah, this is a smaller one, the meadow fritillary. Um, these are a little less common, but I you do uh, if you're doing a count in a in a rural area with fields, they can be pretty ubiquitous. Like I sky meadows, I've seen a lot of them out there. So these are smaller, have more of a plain pattern. Again, uh, you can you can see that the pattern is different. It's got those spots there, uh, just not as intricate in the pattern. And like I said, smaller. So that's a good way to tell those apart. Here's one of my favorites, the Hackberry Emperor. Post on Hackberry trees. So uh, you can see top and bottom, that, that pattern there. Very pretty butterfly. And then again, when he's folded up, he's not as obvious. So you can see this one. He's on the toe of somebody's sand on somebody's sandal. 
That's because these guys really like our sweat. I think they like the minerals from uh, sweat. So if you're sweating, one might land on you. I had one on a really hot day doing a count, landed on my hat. And uh, I didn't brush him away. I wanted to see how long he'd ride my hat. I think he went for about 20 minutes <laughs> swalking around. I guess he got some good minerals off of me. But uh, yeah, they'll often land on you. So, And uh, these guys are fairly common. I see them uh, Bronner Farm by the visitor center often over there. So again, if you see hackberry trees, these guys will likely be around. Here's another one. Okay, now these are called angle wings. You can see they have sort of a sort of a odd uh, shape to their wings, not so rounded. They're like kind of ain't craggly, or you might say. But again, you know, again, you can see the clubs on the uh, antenna. Um, this one's called an eastern comma because it, when the when when uh, they're folded up like this, the bottom they have a comma mark here. You can see that. And the other thing you can see is, uh, so that's easy to tell if you can get a good look. And look at that. If you looked at that, you'd think that's a dead leaf, wouldn't you? <laughs> Until you see the little comma there. So that's amazing camouflage they have. I don't know how I happened to spot him there. But I think this was at Merrimack Farm, in fact. So, uh, and uh, these are, in, and, uh, and when you see one uh, from the top, they have three spots here. You can see that one, two, three. And this is also an interesting butterfly because these along with the question mark, which I'll show you next, and morning cloak, which we don't generally have this time of year, so I don't have that, but they actually winter as adults. So I, uh, there was a day, I don't know if you remember in February, it was like 80 degrees. And I said, there's got to be, there's some Eastern commas out because they will come out on really warm winter days to fly around and they'll they'll look for sap to eat, some little sugar hit. And then when it gets cold, they'll go back under the leaf litter and hibernate again. And sure enough, I went over to Green Spring Garden in an Annandale area and I did find some commons flying around. So uh, that was pretty cool. And I saw some morning clothes fly by too. So uh, that that's pretty cool. You could see these any time of year. But uh, they do winter as adults, which is very unusual. Most butterflies winter as eggs or in the chrysalis, right? So here's the other one, the question mark. Now you can see this one on the right has the little spot. It's got the comma, but then it's got the little spot here, making sort of a question mark. You might call it more of a semicolon, but yeah, go with question mark. And you can see the top here, it's got this extra little bar here. Let me show you that the, the Eastern comma had three. See, one, two, three. Question mark has an extra little bar here. So one, two, three, and four, little bar. So that's what makes it a question mark plus the question mark here. So again, folded up, very camouflaged, looks like a dead leaf almost. I think maybe that's why they have the, the, uh, the angle wing. I mean, it, looks, it really looks like a leaf, doesn't it? <laughs> Must work pretty well. All right, here's one of my favorites, the common buckeye. Very, very obvious. Look at the big eyes. Uh, can't miss it. <laughs> so, uh, there's, I've seen a couple this year. They're, again, going to be more common later in the season, I think. They might be coming out now. But uh, you get a lot of those in the fall, too. All right. Well, here's one I just added for the show tonight. This is an American snout. So you can look here. It looks like it's got a big nose on it, big schnoz here. See that? This one I actually photographed at Huntley Meadows uh, on the tower, on the observation tower, just sitting right on the railing, and it wouldn't move. So everybody else is out uh, photographing uh, gray blue herons or osprey or whatever, and I, I saw this little butterfly, so I photographed them. And they are pretty small. But uh, you see them around. I, it seems like you see them in parking lots around man-made things often. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. But uh, I like. I really like these little guys. I was in a South uh, Rio Grande Valley of Texas once, and they are just everywhere. It's just a huge number in fall. Yeah. Here's a nice one. This is the red-spotted purple. 
This is not a swallowtail. It doesn't have the tails, as you can see. It's called a red spotted purple. And uh, it's actually more of a dark blue, but yeah, we'll go with it. But, uh, you know, not that original name, is it? It's got it's purple, it's got red spots. But these guys uh, are pretty common, and they're going to often be on the edges of woods. This is where I photographed the one on the right. So if you're walking along a trail and there's woods there, look for red spotted purples flying around. And uh, it's going to look, again, it's going to look kind of like a monarch, but no tail. Uh, not a monarch, a swallowtail, but no tail. All right. Here's a cabbage whites, our friends. These guys are actually not native, but you can see this is, uh, I was in, I think this was in uh, Shenandoah National Park. Someone had dumped their uh, grill on the ground and uh, all these butterflies showed up. And what they're doing is they're uh, looking for minerals here. So there's some kind of minerals in that, in that, uh, that ash that they really love. So uh, they all swarm there. It's called that uh, ponding, basically. And sometimes you'll see that. Another place you'll see butterflies sometimes is on uh, poop, actually. Something in poop they like. In Maine, I photographed some uh, Canadian uh, tiger swallowtails on moose poop. So uh, that's very apropos for Maine, right? We don't get those here. They're only up north. That is one thing cool about butterflies. It's the same as birds. You travel to different areas of countries, you'll get completely different species. Yeah, pretty. All right. Yeah, here's our sulfurs. So these are the two most common sulfurs you'll get, the clouded sulfur and the orange sulfur. Uh, they're both the same size. They have very similar looking. But uh, basically, the way I tell them apart, if it's got the slightest bit of orange in it, that's going to be an orange sulfur. Any orange at all, because the clouded sulfurs are totally lemony yellow. So if you see the butterfly flying around and there's just, just totally like very, very pale yellow, the whole butterfly, that's likely to be a clouded sulfur. So that's kind of my rule of thumb. But to make it more complicated, Sometimes the females are white for both species. So you can see uh, that's obviously a male clouded. He's all yellow, but that is a female clouded sulfur. So if you see a white butterfly, uh, look twice. Make sure it's not a cabbage white. Could be a clouded sulfur or white dwarf. So, but there are different, you can see the spots on them, which the, the, uh, these spots, which the uh, cabbage white doesn't have. So. Also, it's hanging out with a male clouded sulfur. So it's a way to tell. So, but again, don't take all uh, white butterflies for granted. All right. Here's a sleepy orange. So this one does not have those spots as we saw on the uh, sulfur. See these, these big dots here? Sleepy orange does not have that. It's got like more like little little almost like stray marks on it to me uh wings are a little bit different shape now i don't have a photo of it open but when it opens it's really tangerine orange uh, and sometimes when they fly you'll see that and the other thing about them is they fly really quickly sometimes so it's like really um contrary to their name they're not sleepy at all they're they're pretty fast flyers usually and they're, they don't land that often either, it seems. So I don't know why they're called sleepy. There must be a story behind it. But uh, often you'll see them. So you see this you, you see this guy, and he does, again, he does not have the spots. And it's going to be a sleepy orange. And they're fairly common. So here's one that people get mixed up. I still do occasionally. But uh, not so much anymore. But this is the pearl crescent and the silvery checker spots. So. Very similar looking butterflies, yes. Uh, main thing to look for, silver checker spot, slightly bigger, but he has these silver spots down here. Pearl Crescent does not have that. So look for these silvers. Also, again, it's got this pale median cells here, medial cells, which the Pearl Crescent doesn't have. But really, if you get a just a quick look, Look Look for these. That's the first field mark I look for. Um, one thing with identifying 
anything, dragonflies, butterflies, birds, whatever field mark works for you is the best field mark for you. If, if you have some other field mark that, that, that you can get on quicker to make a quick ID, that's use it. You don't have to go by what we say. So uh, just telling you what I like, but I think most people look for these silver spots here. And as I mentioned, these are slightly larger than the pearl crescents. Pearl crescents are often like this guy, they're often in grass. So that, that's one thing different. Uh, silver checker spots will be on other leaves and maybe a little higher up. So uh, if you see a little orange guy uh, flying on the ground, that's usually gonna be a pearl crescent. So, all right, here's our blues. We got our Eastern tail blue or ETB for short. So if you're butterflying with me and I say ETB, this is what I'm talking about, an Eastern tail blue. And they do have these little tails here. This is a small butterfly. Again, they uh, generally stay very low. Uh, this one, I kind of got lucky to get a shot of with the wings open. But you can see they got the little tails, little eyes, little spot, orange spots. The uh, azure, summer azure does not have that. It does not have the orange spot or the tails. And these are very, both of these are very common. So uh, these guys stay a little low. They'll stay like around your ankle or knee level. Uh, summer azures will fly higher, get up higher. So if you see a blue butterfly and it's flying a little hot, you know, above your head, that's more likely going to be a summer azure. So that's another. So sometimes uh, you can identify these uh, by behavior as well as what they look like. All right, here's our hair streaks. Uh, there's more hair streaks than these, but uh, these are kind of the more common. Although the juniper uh, is not as common, but the juniper is. Uh, often at the uh, pollinator garden at Merrimack Farm. So that's why I thought I'd include it. Um, I think Kim was the first one to show me one. So uh, that's, uh, I was associate that with her. And uh, there's the gray hair streak that are pretty common. You can see they also have the little tails. This one, not as eh, maybe they got bit off, but he still has them. But this one, you can really see the tails. So what this is, is uh, it looks like antennae and an eye. So I think this is a trick the bird. So the birds will think this is actually the head of the butterfly. And if it bites the back of the wing off, it's the butterfly is going to be okay. If it bites your actual head, you're not, no, that'll ruin your day. But but if he, but uh if you can get away, butterfly just takes a chunk of you back here, which might have happened to this guy, they might have gotten his antenna, then you can continue on your way. So it's an evolutionary adaptation, like just enough extra survived who have this adaptation that it continues in the gene pool through the years. So those are the two. These are very small butterflies. And uh, here's one of my favorites, the red banded hair shirt. Very beautiful. Again, has a little eye looking thing and the antenna, little tails back here. Uh, very brilliant. This, you see this, you know, it's got this very brilliant red band here. Again, very small butterfly. All right. This is one of my favorites, the American copper. So if you see one's very distinctive, got the really beautiful red and grays, silvery gray there. Um, pretty small butterfly. You'll see them in fields often. Uh, what did I get them? I know I get them out in Loudoun County pretty regularly, but I've seen them other places too. Oh, I know where we had them. Bronner Farm, we had them. That's right. At the Manassas Battlefield. So that's a that's a pretty nice one. And here's our wood butterflies, the common wood nymph. This one's pretty distinctive. This is a medium-sized butterfly. It's got this huge pale patch here. So this one's pretty distinctive. Um, apparently, ones in the Midwest, though, don't have this pale patch so that would be a little more confusing but uh it's it's going to be bigger like this one's going to be about the size of a sulfur maybe slightly bigger all right here's our little guys smaller ones the little wood satyr is very small and uh they're so i think their first brood might be about over there might be another brood coming 
So sometimes sometimes the butterflies will kind of disappear between broods, waiting for the new uh, caterpillars to go through their process to become butterflies. So this one, uh, again, you'll see these near the woods often, but you'll see them in fields sometimes too. But these guys, the northern pearly eyes, pretty much only in woods. You'll see, often on the sides of trees like this. So if you look, if you look through uh, a group of trees and you see this sort of triangle sticking out, that could be a northern pearly eye. And you look at the wing patterns, the spot pattern, uh, again, it's good to have a field guide to check this out. But, uh, you know, they this pattern is very distinctive. And here's another one. Now let's talk about skippers. Again, I'm not doing every single butterfly we could ever see, but I'm doing a, a survey here. So this is going to be the easiest skipper to identify. A silver spotted skipper. It's got the big giant spot here. Skippers are butterflies but they're a little bit different family. So they're gonna look a little different. And they're, they're generally smaller than butterfly, than the other butterflies. But they're, uh, they're we, we include them in our account because they are butterflies. They have the little knobs and everything. So this, other skippers, people get a little bit uh, intimidated, but this one you can identify. It's got the big silver spot. All right, so here's uh, here's none. So sometimes they just look like little orange guys flying around. This one is the Zabulon skipper, kind of a cool name. This one uh, often seen on the edge of woods, and you can see both open and closed. So when they're when they're sitting, they look like little jet fighters to me. And this one has the big again. You can see the knobs there. Got the big orange patch here. That's a good way to tell. And then if you look when it's closed, it's got this enclosed orange patch here. So it's got the kind of darker orange around this area here. That's distinctive for a Zabulon skipper. This is a very common skipper. You'll see a good number of them around. Again, as I said, on the edge of woods often. Oh, here's our dusky wings. This is one of the most challenging ones. So these are going to be your two most common dusky wings you're going to see this time of year. Earlier in the year, in the spring, uh, there were juveniles dusky wings, but they're gone. They're, they only have the one brood. So there are there are butterflies, uh, falcate orange tip, juveniles dusky wings. They're only around in the spring, generally. Falcate orange tip, really only April. So we won't we won't worry about them, but right now these are the two you're mostly going to see. So you can see um, there are differences. The main thing to tell them apart is horses has this little spot here. You might have to really get a good look or get a photo. I really encourage if you're counting butterflies to get a lot of photos because you never know what you're going to find. So uh, we we found some new species through photos on the last count I did. So, so it's got this little spot here. The, the uh, wild indigo does not have that. Wild indigo, the pattern on the wings a bit different. You can see it's very dark. These are slightly smaller, a bit different shape, but really they can be very difficult to tell apart. Just take some practice. But if you can spot this little spot here, that is going to be a horse. There's no doubt about it. So here's a common checkered skipper. That one is obvious if you see one. I don't see them a lot, but uh, more in the fall, but you can see them now. You can see them now. So here's another couple of skippers we can talk about. Least skipper, uh, very plain looking, but the best field mark for them is they're really teeny weeny. A very small skipper. So you see a really small little, almost, Looks like I almost think it was a little orange moth, but it's a least skipper. So that's kind of the best field mark for that one. And the right, you have the fiery skipper, which should be starting to come out. Again, this one's a lot more uh, common in the fall, but little orange guy got these spots here. These spots, the other skippers don't won't look like this. So all orange doesn't have the white like this one has and spots fiery skipper 
Before we advance, Larry, we have a question from Kate. Uh, sure. She asks, why are they called different things like hair streaks, skippers, sulfurs? Is there a link with their names? Uh, not sure. <laughs> uh, just, uh, well, skippers, they kind of skip around, I guess. I'm not sure of the uh, origin of the names. That's a good question. There's uh, hair streaks. There must be a reason they call them that. Maybe it's the uh, the little antenna on the back with like little hairs, maybe. I don't know. It's a good question. Can't really say. All right. Anything else? All right. So those are two. All right. Here's here's one of our most common skippers, the sachem. I think a sachem was, uh, wasn't that, I think that was a holy man or a leader for Native Americans, I think, something like that. But uh, this one, if you see one with the wings open on the right, has this big, here's another butterfly term. This is called a stigma, this big dark rectangle here on the wing. And that's a way to tell a sachem. It has this big rectangle here. And you can see the one on the left, it actually kind of bleeds through. You can see it here too. But uh, sachems can be a little confusing. They have a lot of different patterns when they're closed. But uh, again, just look through some examples in your field guide or online if you have one. And uh, you can usually tell them apart. But when the wings are open, look for this big, dark stigma. And often, if you don't know what it is, it's probably a sachem because they're really very common. And they're they're more often going to be uh, on pollinators, on on flowers, as you see them here. Uh, not so much in on the edge of woods, more out in the open. I think is what I usually see of them. Very very common at pollinator gardens. So, all right. Um, here's a couple more skippers. The uh, peck skipper, peck got checks. So again, if you see it like this. He's got the checks. That's a peck skipper. So this very distinctive pattern here. And uh, and then the little glassy wing, kind of a, a purplish sheen. And he's got these little spot band here. But one way to tell them apart, if you get a close look or you get a photo, if you look at the base of the uh, antenna on, on the right here, on the palp, we call these palps sometimes, another word for these, the little clubs, the club here you can see a little white band there. So that's gonna be uh, definitive for a little glassy wing. But, uh, you know, again, kind of a purplish sheen, uh, this kind of not really distinctive spot band here. Again, this both of these are pretty common. Skippers. Uh, oftentimes you're gonna to need to photograph them because they do kind of all look the same at first. But uh, those are just some some tips you can use to try to pick uh, tell them apart. All right. Well, that's all I got. And uh, this is another red spot of purple. I just like the way the uh, light kind of shines through its wings. So uh, I'll take some questions anybody has. Those are beautiful. I always thoroughly enjoy those photos and I'm yeah, really glad that you shared that story about the juniper hair streak I think many of us here probably have similar stories with Kim mine is with the fulcate orange tip so mm -hmm. thank you for that I did want to circle back to Max's question um, you know we've got this lay of the lands of uh, many different butterflies and he commended you for showing you know the differences between the wings being open and closed and um, was wondering if you had a recommendation for field guides that well, depict yeah. both of those. Well, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yes. This is uh, Butterflies of the Mid-Atlantic. That's the good one. And uh, this is by Bob Blakeney and our friend Judy Gallagher. So this is an excellent uh, Butterflies of the Mid-Atlantic. This is, this is the newest this is an updated guide. So uh, I would highly recommend this. And I'll show you, if you look at the pages, you can see it's got real nice photos. Um, for example, see there's the gray spangled fritillary. It gives you all the 
open and close all the different angles, right? And uh, and then uh, for the entire nation, I use this one. This is the uh, Kaufman guide. So this one is set up almost like a bird guide. You can see, you can see that. See, it's got the all the different butterflies. It's got the range maps, kind of like a Sibley guide. So this is where I keep my uh, master checklist too of all the butterflies I've seen. <laughs> I think it's 160 something. I don't know. But wow. Anyway, um, um, so these are the my two go tos. These are the two I always carry in the field. So. Amelia, do you want to uh, come in and ask your question? And then I'll go to Maxine. Sure. Uh, hang on. I'm having. OK, that's me. Um, my question was just whether there are any apps that can help those of us who might need some help <laughs> out in the field. Um, I volunteered to help on the butterfly count and I'm like one of the zone leaders and I am, I can devise a plan with a map to go to different places, but I cannot ID butterflies terribly well. So um, you can use um, iNaturalist. Okay. And that I think there's something called Seek that people okay. use. Do you know any others, Ashley? Those are the two that I would recommend. Yeah. Um, okay. Also, if you if you have any doubts, just take the photos and send them to us. Yeah. Send them to me, um, send them to Ashley, and she can send them to me, and we can figure them out. You know. Yeah. I I've never had terribly great luck getting photos of butterflies and skippers. Okay. But um, I will certainly, you know, I'll obviously try. Yeah. So. But use those two apps work pretty well. Okay. Well, I I will have someone else with me who's um my butterfly person but okay good um, all right so you'll have yeah. someone who's experienced i'll be relying on her <laughs> okay awesome thanks uh maxine and then i'll go to allison okay um yeah uh you had shown the pictures of the um the swallowtail and um i just was curious as to for the yellow ones how do you tell which one is the male and which one is the female and maybe you said it and i just missed it um the female is going to have a lot of blue on her. Okay. Yeah. So the males don't have any blue. They're all yellow. So you can see on my Judy's field. My field okay. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So. And and follow one question. The gland that you um, mentioned, I think, was on the monarchs. Is that mm -hmm. on the top or on the bottom? Is that like when um, you mostly can just or? only see it on the top? Okay. Um, okay. I think actually you can see it on the bottom. No, you can see it on both. It's really obvious on the top, but you can see it on the bottom. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. that Allison, can you can come on in and ask your question. Oh, thanks. Um, just did you have any suggestions for native plants to have in a shady forest edge yard? That's what we have in Arlington. And we've got a lot of mature oaks, maples, and tulip poplar. We have a spice bush, but anything that I could plant, uh, you know, in border gardens or whatever that would attract more butterflies that you can think of. I mean, well, again, you, 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 there's host plants and there's nectar plants. So if you're attracting the caterpillars or you're attracting the uh, pollinators. pollinators. The yeah, I guess I'm thinking more of the pollinators. Yeah, um, just as long as they're native plants, um, I'm not. I'm not really a gardener, gardener so I'm not, I'm not sure. sure. If it's anyone else, a gardener would know. If anyone yeah. wants to, oh, that's, that's, I, 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 yeah, Amelia, that's the one I I was mentioning the uh, the uh, north butterfly. Yeah. Um, okay. I I went to the the garden center and asked. Yeah. <laughs> which, I I mean I kind of over the last couple of years have built. A little bit of a pollinating garden and okay. i don't know much of about gardening so i just that's where i went and asked <laughs> asked them for advice so. right and yeah. another yeah. thing oh there's consider... sharon has some uh, astros yeah. goldenrod flax and milkweed yep yeah, yeah. and just Thank one, you. one yeah. thing to consider is or to remember like larry was mentioning um the host plants and so you want to provide food for the caterpillar 
Um, and so, yeah, just taking into consideration the life cycle, we saw a lot of really great photos of, of butterflies nectaring, um, but a lot uh, to really have those, those butterflies, you need to have habitat for the caterpillar. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's see. And going back to uh, caterpillars, um, Sharon asked if there are any, any guides that include caterpillars. Um, there's probably are. I'm sure there's a field guide somewhere that has caterpillars. I'm not sure though. So I kind of just photograph and figure them out as we go. <laughs> that seems like a, an opportunity for any of those right. Um, right. photographer enthusiasts to put together a, a book. And um, there's a lot of really great resources uh, in the, the chat. So I'll be sending out a follow-up email and I will include um I'll I'll include the the chat as well so you can reference. Oh there we go. Caterpillars of Eastern North America. There you go. Okay. Mm -hmm. I knew there had to be one. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Okay. And and then Kathy also um put in a uh um um a website for host plants. So cool. a lot yeah. of really good, good information. Uh, and a good reminder that, you know, we love looking at butterflies and the butterflies and the caterpillars need good habitat to do that. And so mm -hmm. it's great that people are thinking about what plants to put in their gardens and transforming their lawns into high quality habitat for things like butterflies, but then other species as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, the plant, the, the link between plants and butterflies is so you know it's vital obviously hmm. then you might need to be okay with attracting some what was it a crab spider too that photo is really cool <laughs> <laughs> thanks oh kevin uh, you can ask has questions about the count yeah come on in test hello yep hey, i kevin. can hear you Hello. Um, yeah. Do you count the males and the females? Is that part of the data that you're collecting? No, I just, I just, no, it's just kind of for general interest. Okay. Do yeah, you, uh, is it solely with um, uh, cameras and binoculars or do you also net uh, butterflies? No, no, we only photograph them. We don't net them. Are, okay. Are there any um, uh, like, people that have like pollinator gardens that volunteer their areas or is this like only parks i think there are yeah there are people um that open their their houses to us and and but we've already worked that out but if okay. you have other uh people that you're thinking of, then we can certainly see if we can add them. This is for the Manassas circle here in Prince William. So we can certainly okay. uh, look to expand and um, and that would be great. I recently acquired a net that I have a, a story about. Um, the uh, monarch uh, tagger, uh, Larry Brinza, who ta tagged the monarch butterflies for 13 years I know him. in coastal Virginia, um i went to a garage sale and it was his house he recently passed away in december oh. and i was uh, i saw a presentation by him uh in the mid 2000s at occoquan bay national wildlife refuge and i excitedly uh talked to his wife and daughter and uh and i have his uh net now so if you Google pictures of him online and he has this big butterfly net with a purple handle. I have that now. Oh, that's a, it's, it's pretty cool. That's like an artifact. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> heirloom. Wow. I think you have to be licensed to, to net butterflies. Ah, you better okay. check it, check into that. Yeah. Well, I wasn't sure. really planning to, unless somebody like on this count was qualified and I could bring it along. <laughs> Yeah, now nah, we 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 kind of discourage it. Butterflies are 
kind of delicate more. I mean, um, people will net uh, dragonflies, and that's fine because they're tough. Uh, Interesting. Just, just to catch and release, but uh, they do that. But butterflies, I know I'll be leery because uh, they can get beat up pretty pretty easily uh, in a net, I think. It's a more historical etymological strategy. Exactly. It is, yeah, he said it's a historical artifact. I didn't know he had passed away. So uh, thanks for that. You know, appreciate the news. But uh, yeah, I've seen him. I saw him do a talk uh, many years ago about the butterflies. Yeah, he's he did a lot of uh, important work. So, Sharon, did you want to come in and um, share your comment? Um, I I just noted that some of the monarch um, butterfly organizations do suggest netting the monarch. So it's interesting to hear this conversation. Um, I've never been able to catch one to tag it. They're too fast for me, but um, <laughs> thank you for sharing that information. Yeah. Well, if you're tagging them, you got to catch them. Yeah. <laughs> well, but I think if you're them. tagging them, then you're, you also need to have a, the appropriate license yeah, to do right, that. Right, right, right. So yeah, on the counts, we don't, again, we don't net them. Just, just, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, obviously the people who are permitted to uh, tag them would need to catch them with a net, yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Uh, do we have any? No, uh, no license to tag a butterfly. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Not. I wonder who issues the tags. I, I don't have know. Lots of questions. Yeah, maybe not. Um, maybe it's because I'm a hawk bander. So of course, like you know, the banding of hawks are, uh, you know, all, all of the bands go through USGS for that, yeah. and permits and all of that. So yeah. anyone can buy the you buy the tags from Monarch Watch. Oh, okay, I know. And, and anyone can get the tags, and then anyone okay. can um, tag monarchs in the fall. Okay, good you to know. Thanks, you better, Karen. You better check Thank that out because I don't think that's right. Well. Who knows? Uh, yes, sir. You're thinking of California, which is a loner state. So uh, no, that's not right. Uh, actually, um, I don't know. Steve and I are monarch conservation specialists with Monarch Watch. Okay. Um, so okay. if you have any questions, you can uh, look our information up on Monarch Watch. Okay. And you but can email you, us from there. I assume you only tag them in the fall, the the, the migratory exactly. ones, right? Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. only the super generation exactly right, right. That makes and there's sense. there's no rule there's no rules for any state except for california right now is doing their own thing i see okay mm -hmm. well actually i think that makes sense because uh the more tags the better absolutely you get a lot more data that's how, that's how we got that's how uh, we got all the information that we have yeah I, I'm, I'm with you cool interesting um never thought of doing that interesting so they so do you get tags that are specific to your area so you'll like know people will know where they came from how does that work they monarch watch will only will send the tags in sort of in priority order to uh where you are and where the migration starts in your area obviously it starts sooner uh canada and northern uh, united states and then uh mm -hmm. later um but then it's just random but yeah. you excuse me as you tag you actually uh list the number and your location and then you submit all of that data to monarch watch okay okay and then they issue their reports each year um of the found tags in mexico and and or or anywhere along the route mm -hmm. uh they they report all that data on a report after everyone has submitted everything a, a lot of people like up at cape may will uh catch the tag monarchs and re report that they have seen one there and that helps them calculate how quickly they traveled from either massachusetts or canada to get to that point so you know uh, they okay. even encourage if if people capture record and then send them the information they input that into the it, it's it's all data and the more data they can get the better it it helps them understand yeah. that one that i showed you the photo of i actually did report that one and it had been yeah. Good. <laughs> so. yeah, right. that's, that's exactly yep. what you need that's to what's do. needed yeah thank you Good. cool well thanks for that information
So, and it's right. a good reminder that a lot of the, these conservation efforts are done by, you know, community scientists, science projects, um, like the butterfly counts and, um, and, and Karen, what you were explaining about the tagging and uh, even the hawk banding that I do in Cape May that is run by community uh, citizen scientists, mostly. So um, with, you know, a couple of professional um biologists here and there. So um, we're, we're all working together to make a difference and protect the biodiversity that we have. And, um, and then we're learning together and having some fun in the meantime, too. Um, and um, Max, your question about the butterfly count, um, we host it in the, Mana the Manassas Circle, and we have various sectors. This year, we have, I think, five uh, sector sectors and sector leaders. And so if you want more information, um, I'll go ahead and uh, you can reach out to me and um, at Alliance. Yeah, so it's it's a circle. I don't know if you're familiar with Christmas bird count circles. It's a circle and the middle is, is it Manassas, somewhere in Manassas, but, but it's- I think it's, it's a, around either, I can't remember if it's um, if the point is like the, at the airport or I, I can't remember what that yeah, center is. But it's large areas. So like I do the battlefield and the Bull Run Winery and then uh, people do Merrimack Farm and some, I don't know what all the other areas around there. Various, garden. the Manassas training gardens. Yeah, but it's not just in the, in Manassas. It's, it's anywhere in the circle. Uh, okay, I just didn't understand what the circle was. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you go to the NABA, North American Butterfly Association, you will, and you do uh, NABA circles, Google NABA circles, you'll see it there. They have okay. all the butterfly circles in the country there. Okay, and so when you when you register, do you get assigned a, a location or do you pick your location or... Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, if you were to join us, I would put you with Larry Mead and you would be doing the uh, battle, the Manassas battlefield and um, yeah. what he just described. Yeah, okay. I, can I can, I can use, I can take a couple more people, a few more people, sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks, Maxine. And then we'll have a tally rally at the end, which is yeah. a lot of fun. And at the, uh, what is it? The city? City tavern in Manassas. City tavern. There you go. Mm -mm. Yeah. 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 But thank you, Larry. This has been a, a pleasure. And I think we all learned something today. Um, you enjoyed and it. That's, that's always, that's always a, um, a good goal to have for these presentations. So, right. and um, I, I'll be following, like I mentioned, I'll be following up with an email and Larry will be available if you have any questions. And then this this program will be uploaded to our YouTube channel for you to reference and to share 